It is an honor. It is an honor for uh, Darcy and I, and actually my mother-in-law is here with us as well, uh, to be with you this morning and uh, just to um, just to enjoy God with you. Um, I, w- I will give you my first impression of this morning. Uh, I, I'm I'm absolutely convinced that you believe who God is. And I'm absolutely convinced that you love him. Um, the volume in the room, the, um, the adoration that you have brought to him, the attention that you've given to him this morning is, uh, is really inspiring. And um, um, I can sense God's presence here. And I, and I pray um, that God's spirit would just uh, continue to flow through the aisles of this room and that you will sense him in a way that uh, perhaps it's been a while or perhaps you've never sensed him before. I don't, obviously, I don't know who you are, but you know what? If you are, uh, if you are in love with Jesus, then we are family. <laughs> we are family. And, uh, and so it's so good to be here with you. We've had plenty of opportunity this weekend just to to meet many of you and uh, to hear your heart for God and to hear about the passion that God has given to you for the community here. And, and uh, you've been given the opportunity to listen to, to my wife and I and to kind of allow us to share our heart uh, for our love for God and for our love for his church. And so we, uh, we are so grateful that you've invited us to be here this morning. And uh, we just want to continue to give God the attention that he deserves. And so uh, I hope you brought your Bibles this morning. And I'm going to, I'm going to, in a moment, I'm gonna, we're going to be reading uh, 1 John chapter 3. The title of the message this morning is Living Like Jesus. Is that possible? Well, according to God's word, it is. We're going to look at that this morning. But before we begin, I, I want to ask you a, a, a question. If you could change anything about yourself... What would you change? Would it be your appearance? Would it be your temperament? Would it be your habits? If there was anything that you could change about yourself, what would you change? The day is coming when uh, we will see Jesus face to face. Scripture tells us that. And... uh, and scripture tells us that we will be like him. We will be like him. And I want to look at this passage of scripture that John writes about. First John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And he tells us this incredible truth. He writes like this. And see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it does not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone, everyone, everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Will you pray with me? Father, this morning we've been in conversation with you. Lord, it is so good to be with your children this morning and just to hear their prayers and hear their conversation with you, Lord God. And Father, this morning as we, um, as we seek your wisdom and your counsel through your word, we pray, Lord, that even if this passage is familiar to us, that, Lord God, your Holy Spirit would um, commune with us in such a way that he would confirm and affirm the truth that we already know. Lord, I pray for that individual here this morning who uh, 
this may be new news. This may be good news. And they don't, they're not walking with you this morning today. Lord, I pray for that individual this morning that your Holy Spirit would welcome them and that they would sense you in such a way that they will say before they leave this place, I want to be like Jesus. I want to live like him. I want to walk with him. Father, please answer our prayers this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this time. May you be honored, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. For followers of Christ, um, what is the best? What is the best news that one could hear? Hmm. If somebody walked up to you at school or at your work or in the street and asked you, you know, I know you. You're a, you're a follower of this Jesus. And they would ask you, what is the best news you could possibly hear? What would you say to them? We, <laughs> yeah, we've been singing about it all morning. The best news that we could hear is that God loves me. God loves you. He loves you. This is the central theme throughout the Scripture, the Bible, from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation that's the theme, that God loves us. And, and the Apostle John records that for us in his gospel account, that, that God loves us so much that he gave his best gift that he could possibly give to us, his son Jesus Christ. We've been singing about him. We've been singing to him. So that all who believe on his name will receive his gift and live for eternity now and forever. We'll put it another way, God proved his love by giving us his son, so that we may live like Jesus and desire for him to live his life in us and through us. The reason God created you, the reason why God created you, is so that you would know him. And not only know him and be secured of the eternal life that he's promised us, but so that as you live your life on this earth right now, you would walk as Jesus walked. And give glory to Him. If you do nothing else with your life, in your life, according to God, the most important thing you could do is live like Jesus. And so God is asking us this morning that exact, that exact question. If you could change anything in your life, what would you change? There are three important aspects to this extravagant gift that that we receive from God that's important for us to fully embrace in order for us to live like Jesus. The first thing is this, God's provision for us. Eternal life doesn't begin when we die, it begins when we believe. Eternal life doesn't begin when we die, it begins when we believe. In John chapter, 1 John 1, verse, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 again, gives us that, that uh, affirms that truth, and he says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it does not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. You see, God wants us to live as Jesus lived. John begins by talking about God's love and, and, and declaring His amaz- this, in amazement that we should be called children of God. And so when John writes, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, he's literally saying, there is no other love like this. You will never experience any other kind of love like the kind of love that God can give. This love has never been seen by anyone before. This love, John says, is literally out of this world. You will never experience God's love in, other, in any other way, in any other form, other than from God to, directly to you. It is literally out of this world. Before the New Testament era, the idea of this love, this agape love, this unconditional, this sacrificial, divine love was not known. 
In fact, love at that time was a matter of keeping score. It was a, you rub my back and I'll rub yours kind of love. But agape is different. It, 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 it expects literally nothing in return. It was love just for the sake of loving you. God loved you not because you deserved it. God loved you because he loved you. In the moment you were conceived in your mother's womb, God says, I'm going to prove my love to that, this one. And so John is amazed that God actually loves us so much that he calls us what? Children. You belong to me. You are mine. As followers of Jesus, we're, we're united to him as a, as a father and a child relationship because of that relationship, Satan, Satan hates uh, and the world hates us just because, just because of God, just because we are connected to God. The moment we said yes to Jesus, at that moment, we became enemies of the world and we became enemies of Satan. Satan knows that he can't attack God, and so who does he attack? You, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have a huge bullseye on your back. And constantly, and perhaps you know this better than I do, constantly, every day, at every opportunity, he's trying to trip us up some way, somehow. And guess what? He knows your weaknesses better than you do. He hates God. And because we're his kids, he hates us too. But the good news is that the love that God has given to us, nothing or no one can ever be separate. No one can separate that from us. In fact, Romans, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 confirms this. In Romans chapter 8, verses 31, 31 through 39, we read these words. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will we not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies it. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long and are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, no, a thousand times no. In all these things, we, you, are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And so God, even though we are children, as we are children of God, Satan knows that, that nothing, he knows better than, this truth better than anything else, that nothing will be able to separate us from him. Nevertheless, he continues to try to trip us up. Let's look again at closely at 1 John Chapter 3, verse 2, he says, Beloved, we are children, we are children now. The most important word in that phrase is the word now. What, what does it mean by that? It means that if we have given our lives to Christ, He is our Lord, we are children, we are children today of God, today, right now, at this moment. We are living the eternal life now. One of the things that uh, 
my family and I love to do, we love to vacation in Santa Barbara. Anybody been there, Santa Barbara? We love to vacation in Santa Barbara, even though we live in San Diego, we love the beaches in San Diego, we love to vacation in Santa Barbara. It's something about just getting away. And so we'll spend about a week there and uh, enjoy just doing absolutely nothing, very little, except enjoying ourselves with one another. But one of the things I really love to do when I go to vacation in Santa Barbara, I'll get up early in the morning. I'm an early, I'm an early riser. I do my best work between the hours of about 6 to noon. And I'll get up before my wife gets up, before our kids get up, and I'll, 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 I'll take our, my a bike and I'll, start, and I'll ride uh, at sunrise, basically, along the coast. I'll take a ride down East Beach to Santa Barbara, and I'll head up, head up to the hills near Montecito, if you're familiar with that area, and I'll head up to Montecito, ride my bike through the village of Montecito, and then I'll, I'll head down the little road that leads down to the Biltmore Hotel right along the coast of Santa Barbara. I'll park my bike there for just a moment, and I'll, uh, I'll just meditate. I'll spend some time with the Lord. We'll have a good conversation. I'll get less lost in his presence, and then, and then I'll say, well, I'm halfway through, so I better get back on my bike because my kids are going to wonder where the father went. Maybe he disappeared. Get back on my bike, and on the way back, I'll, I'll, ride, a, I'll ride my bike along the coast and through the neighborhood. And right at the end, heading back towards Santa Barbara, there is a cemetery there. A cemetery that overlooks the ocean. I'll ride up into the cemetery and I'll park my bike and then I'll take another leisurely walk through the tombstones. And many of those tombstones, you'll find this phrase, in fact, you'll find this phrase in any cemetery that you come to, you'll find this phrase, entered into eternal life. I understand the sentiment behind those, that phrase and those words, but taking them literally is really kind of inaccurate. Why? Because as followers of Jesus, we enter into eternal life the moment we believe. When we place our faith in Him, eternal life is granted to us the moment we say, Yes, Jesus I believe in who you are. I believe in what you did on the cross. I believe that you rose again. And I believe that you're coming back for me again. And I believe that one day I will live with you and I will reign with you. And I will bring glory to you forever and ever and ever. I believe. In that moment, in that moment, God grants us everlasting life. The truth is, The truth is, everyone is going to live forever, either an everlasting life with God or everlasting death without God. Everyone that makes a decision for Jesus Christ will enter eternal life, but that decision must be made in this life. You see, our physical death is simply the moment that seals our destination forever. That's what death is. It's just, it's just a, a doorway to our eternal home. But today, if you are a follower of Jesus, <laughs> the good news is that you are living the everlasting life. Romans 10.9 tells us, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is the best news anybody could hear that they can have that they can have that absolute assurance this on this life in this day knowing that the moment they say yes to Jesus they have everlasting life and John 3:36 further confirms this by saying whoever believes in the son has eternal life note the word has in that verse John didn't write will have or might have or should have or hopefully will have, anyone who confesses and believes the Son has present, is living the eternal life right now. In fact, Jesus himself affirmed this truth in John chapter 5, verse 24. And he said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
Whoever hears my words and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Note again, Jesus says, has passed from death to life. That means right now, in this moment, in the present, we are living in eternity. Now, I, I realize it may not seem that way. It may, it may not feel that way. God says, don't believe your feelings. Sometimes the enemy will use our feelings, our emotions, to try to confuse us and to trip us up into believing that what we're living now is not the truth. The fact of the matter is, the moment we believe, Jesus says, you now have eternal life. Anyone who has accepted Christ's gift of forgiveness, forgiveness of sin, has believed in Jesus as their Savior and Lord, has eternal life, and that is, has passed from death to life. I don't know if you know this, I'm sure you know this, that when you go to school or when you go to work, when you, go, when you walk around in your neighborhood or when you go shopping in the store, there are many people, now I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't recommend that you say this in public, but there are many people who are walking dead men. They are living, but they are experiencing the eternal death even today because they don't know the hope of Jesus Christ. And you see, part of, part of our hope, part of the mission that God has given to us as believers, as his children, is to lead people to the Father, is to lead people to the hope that we have in him. And there are people in your sphere of influence, people that you know very, very well, some of your classmates, some of your workmates, some of your, your neighbors that you've known for decades, they are lost. They are dead men walking. Again, don't call them that. <laughs> but they need to hear the truth. They need to hear the fact that God has given us a way of escape of, from this eternal death. Anyone who has accepted Christ's gift of forgiveness and sins and has believed in Jesus has eternal life now. Secondly, another important aspect to this gift of God is God's plan for us. One day we will be with Jesus. In John, 1 John 3, 2, he writes, and, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. We, we could revel indefinitely in, in, in what God has provided for us even right now. Even as we are living our life, even as we are conducting business, even as we're going to school, we can revel in that hope even at this point in, in our lives. We could, we, and, and at the same time, we can look towards the future. John writes, when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Exactly as he is? Exactly as he is. If we, if, if we think being included in God's family is good news, and it is, what about the fact that one day we will be like Jesus? That's an amazing truth that, that is rarely contemplated by the average believer. One day, you, you will be like Jesus. John gives us four things to consider as we think about this truth. One that we can't know about. It's impossible for us as humans to even fathom that. But there are three things that we absolutely can know about this amazing truth that we will be like Jesus. The first truth is we can't know all the details of what it will be like to be like Jesus. We can't know that. Because of our humanity, our relationship with Jesus now is only, is only a taste. It's only a foreshadowing of what being like him will be like. But when we begin to see that vision in our future with Jesus, many New Testament verses begin to to take on a, a new meaning, such as Romans chapter 8, verses 18 and 19. It says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy comparing to the, to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing sons of God. So Paul uses the language to suggest that, that we ought to be standing 
that we ought to be standing on tiptoe, craning our necks to get a glimpse of the glory that one day will be ours, that, that God is going to reveal to us. If there were a wall that was separating us from our humanity to, to God's divinity, Paul is saying we as believers with this incredible hope should be craning our necks just to get a glimpse of what this hope is ultimately going to look like. But we can't know that in full detail right now. But it's going to be our reality when we see Jesus face to face. In fact, Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 assures us, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to himself. Even though, even though we can't know all the details of our glorious identity now, his power will make this reality one day. And we can know this, we can know this by this. That in fact, we can know three things for sure about this, this glorious body, this glorious image that God is going to give, us, give to us. And some of you this morning are thinking, thank God, I can't wait to get, <laughs> get rid of this body that I have. It's causing me grief. I walk about four days a week for about 45 minutes. And during that time, I'm, I'm in conversation with God, but I'm also doing my, doing my push-ups and, and I'm doing my sit-ups. And, you know, just so that way I, I don't cause uh, grief for my wife later on in life. <laughs> One day, one day we're going to shed these broken down bodies of ours. Even though you may be young this morning, <laughs> one day, <laughs> one day you're going to be supernatural. Can you believe that? <laughs> there are three things we can know about these bodies, though. We can know the description about the, our future with Jesus. There are more things we can know about our future with Jesus than we can't know. And here are three of them. We know that he will show up again. We know that Jesus is going to show up for a second time on earth. The Bible is filled with this truth. Actually, there are, there's more revelation in Scripture about his second coming than about his first. In fact, the, the chronology of the human race is marked by, the, by time before before Jesus was born, B.C., and after he died, A.D., and his second showing will be no less historic or significant than his first. In fact, the second time will usher us into eternity with him. Listen to how Titus describes this in Titus chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, he confirms this. He says, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Jesus Christ has come into the world and he will show up again one day. We don't know that time or the hour. This is our certain hope revealed in the truth of Scripture. The second description about our future with Jesus is, we, shall, we, shall, we, we know we shall be like him. We can know that. In fact, the apostle affirms this in 1 John, again, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 2, he says, but we know when he appears, we shall be like him. 
Scientifically, we don't know how that's going to happen, but it's going to happen. I read about uh, one man's dying wish to have his cremated remains uh, incorporated into a large firework display so that, that he could be shot in the sky and explode with the red and the green flames. And so his, uh, his, family, his family honored his request. They took his cremated remains and, and, uh, and, he, and they incorporated that into a fireworks display. I don't know how he did it, but they did it. They put it in the, the powder, and then when, when the fireworks were shot into the air, boom, there was just this incredible display with human remains. <laughs> You know what? Our glory is going to be much more spectacular than that. Instead of of four seconds of, wow, (laughs) our glory will last how long? For eternity. For eternity. Instead of the the oohs and the ahas from the crowd, we will hear Jesus' voice calling out to us, well done, Well done, my good and faithful servant. We will rise and meet him in the air, his glory superior and filling the sky from the east to the west. The Apostle Paul reminds us often of this inevitable transformation when he writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, for those who, who he foreknew also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Can you believe that? You. You remember what you looked like first thing this morning when you looked in the mirror? Maybe some of you don't remember. I went to go get my haircut this week. I get my haircut every six weeks, whether I need it or not. And I sat down on the chair, and uh, the gal who cuts my hair quite frankly, has been cutting my hair for the last 30 years, if you can believe that. I sat down in the chair and I looked in the mirror and I said, dude, you look old, man. (laughs) In that moment, as I sat down in that chair, God reminded me, son, One of these days, the reflection of your countenance is going to be identical to my son, Jesus Christ. His image one day will be yours. It's hard for us to imagine that when we see our face first thing in the morning, but it's true. One day, we will reflect the image of our Son, of the Son, Jesus Christ. In fact, it was an amazing thought that we shall become like Jesus, and, and it will happen in the twinkling of an eye, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 52. A third description we, we can know about our future is this. We, we know we will see Him as He is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. Can you believe that? Because we shall see him as he is. The Apostle Paul echoed John's thoughts when, when he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 3.18. He says, and, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in, in the, into the same image of the, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So we're going to be changed fully into Christ's image when he returns. And, but we also are being changed into his glorious likeness even when, even now. Even now. Our relationship with God is a, a journey towards becoming like Jesus. A journey that will be completed when we will finally see Jesus face to face at his return. And all of us we should be able to say, I, I'm not yet what I should be or what I want to be, but neither am I where I used to be. I've been walking with the Lord 
How old am I now? I just turned uh, I just turned 58. I know I look older than that. I just turned 58. I came to faith in Jesus Christ 53 years ago. When I was a little guy as a five-year-old, Jesus caught my attention. And he says, I want your life. I created you to know me. It's, it's hard to understand that concept, but God loves us in such a way that he wants to walk with us. And, and he wants, every year that passes, he wants us to look back on where he led us in our journey. And he wants us to say, God, Lord, I'm much more closer to the image of your son today than I was two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, thirty years ago. As we walk with Jesus, he wants us to look more and more like him. Some research indicates that the longer couples are married, the more they begin to resemble one another. I feel sorry for my wife. <laughs> we'll be married 26 years in May. But it, isn't that true? The, the longer couples live with one another, are married to one another, get to know one another, they begin to look like each other. It's a crazy thing. You know why? Because they spend a lot of time listening to each other, looking at one another. If they are intimately in love with one another, they want, they want to give of themselves, so much so that eventually, over time, they become to look like one another. That's our hope. Regardless of what happens to us in this life, we know Jesus is going to show up again, and we shall be like him, and we shall see him as he is for all eternity. The third important aspect to this gift, and this is the last important aspect, is God's purpose for us to reveal his purity in this life. 1 John 3.3 3 again confirms this, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as Jesus is pure. Some people don't like to study prophecy because they, because they think it's too far into the future and, and, and that's, that's not relevant for today, but, but that's not true. Every, everywhere in Scripture where you find the word future, you'll also find a word about today, the present. And so in 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, we see the hope that Jesus has, has been talking about and one day, we who have made Jesus our Lord will be like him. So if this is true about us anyway, why, why do we need to keep ourselves pure? If we're going to be like Jesus one day, why do we need to keep ourselves pure? That's a good question. Simply because of what Jesus has done for us. He took our sin upon himself that we might have an eternal home with God. And for us to want to live a pure life for him is our response to our gratitude for His love. The truth is, the greatest motivation for a pure and holy life is the deep awareness of God's love. The more we know the heart of the, His heart of love for us, the less we are likely to sin against Him and break His heart. Elsewhere, the Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, and, and verse 28, says, Whoever says he abides in Him ought to walk in the same way that he walked. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. You see, God's purpose for us is to reveal his purity, for us to reveal his purity in this life today. I read about a high school girl who was on a, on a group date who asked her date to take her home she said, I want you to take me home, and I want you to take me home now. Why? Because she found out that, that the group was, was going to another party where inappropriate activity was going to take place. And so she looked at her date, and she says, I, I need you to take me home, and I need you to do that ASAP. Some others in the group looked at her and sarcastically said, are you afraid your father will hurt you 
if he finds out where you went. And then she replied, no, no. My father would never hurt me. My father loves me too much to do that. What I am afraid of is that I will hurt my father. You see, that's a, that's a perfect example of how Jesus wants us to live in this life right now, today, and in the days to come. He wants us to be as pure as He is pure. Not because it's a mandate, not because it's a requirement, but because we are so amazed at the love of God and the way God has invested His love in us. So that when we, when we are tempted and when we are tried and when we are... When we, when, when the enemy comes in and he puts a full core press on, press on us and he, he wants us to compromise our faith in some way, we can say, no, no. My father loves me too much and I love my father too much to break his heart. You see, one day, God is going to reveal himself to us. We will see him face to face. And we should not want our life here on earth to hurt our Heavenly Father in any way. We should desire our life to reveal His glory at all times and in every way. And we, the Father wants us to be pure as Jesus Christ Himself is pure. It's true. We can't go back and undo the years already spent. We can't do that. But we can live the years that we have spent, that we have left in, in a way that reflects God's provision that reflects God's plan for us, and that reflects God's purpose for us. We can live our lives like we believe. We can live our lives today knowing that one day that we will see Jesus, and when we see Him, we will be like Him. And we can live in eternity now with purity in mind. Folks, that, that's living like Jesus in a nutshell. First John chapter 3, verses 1-3. through 3. So let me ask you, the same question I started with this morning. If you could change anything about yourself, what would you change? Or better yet, if God, with your permission, because God is a gentleman, if God, with your permission, could change anything about you, what, he, what would he want to change today? Whatever he would change, it would be for one reason and one reason alone, to help you live like Jesus. So that you can reflect his image, so that he may re receive glory in this life and the life hereafter. Is that your desire? Is that your desire today? Will you pray with me? Father God, thank you, Lord for reminding us this morning how you have called each and every one of us. Father, thank you, Lord, that um, you've given us a hope that we don't have to be like walking dead people who think they're living. But Lord, we can walk We can walk in your righteousness. We can walk in your grace. We can walk in your purity. Father, we know we're human. You know we're human. And that's why you've given us your son. That's why you've given us your spirit. So that we can be empowered by your spirit. Moment by moment. Day by day. Month by month. Year by year. However long you allow us to live on this planet. And then the good news, the great news, the better news is that when this life is over, <laughs> we have just begun. And I ask you a question this morning. Do you have that hope? I want to talk to a young person today who's here. Perhaps you find yourself easily succumbing to
through the temptations of this life. I believe God is knocking on your door today. And he is saying, let's let's walk together. Let's quit playing this game. I don't want to play religion with you. I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to experience life abundantly to the fullest. Will you give me your all? today will you give me everything I want your heart I want you to experience me like you've never experienced me today will you let me do that for you perhaps you're here today and and you have just been struggling in your faith It's hard for you to even look at next week, much less at eternity, because you're facing a lot of pressures or confusion or stress. And God is saying to you this morning, take my yoke. It is it is light. Will you release those concerns to me today? Let's walk together. Let me live through you. You don't have to perform for me. That's not what this life of freedom means. All you have to do is let me live through you, and I will take care of everything else. Will you release that to him today, whatever it is? Father God, I pray that as you continue to commune with us today that we will find ourselves releasing whatever you are asking us to release and that you will change us Father ultimately we want to be changed in your image if there was anything that we could change about ourselves is that we would become more like Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this time. Help us to worship to you as we as we continue to look to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, God bless you as we worship him.